All right. Welcome to uh, Test of Study Hall. Um, the study hall this week is SAT Math Functions. Functions questions are a subset of algebra. Uh, we run study hall every Monday, 9 p.m. Eastern. You can get back here by going to studyhall.tested.com. I'm the real Tom Rose. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Testive. I'm a professional teacher, and I'm also, um, in a former life, was a professional function designer, meaning what I would do is work with people to come up with um, custom functions for different, uh, different scenarios. In fact, one of the things that I do um, at Testive is help develop the set of functions that we use to customize the learning experience on our platform. So for those of you who are using it, you may have, uh, you may have noticed that one of the great things about Testive is it automatically adjusts to you. Uh, well, that takes a whole lot of um, that takes a whole lot of functions in order to make that work, and those functions are what we use to tune the platform to each of you, and they're pretty complicated. And that's what I uh, did for the first uh, maybe half of the time that I was working for Testive. All right, so let's talk a little bit about functions. First of all, what is a function? Um, Uh, functions are 11% of all math questions. Um, functions contain, I think this is the thing that, that really messes up a lot of folks, are that functions contain a lot of confusing notations. Um, you'll see symbols and you'll see some notations that you maybe haven't seen before or you don't know how to interpret. Um, so how do you get better at, at solving functions questions? Um, one, by understanding the function notation. So make sure that you know what you're reading. Um, and st step two, uh, keep track of the input, the operation, and the output. So all functions have these three components, and, and let's talk about what they are. So here's a function. Here's a very simple function. Um, and he, in here, you can see three components. So the first component um, is what we're going to call the input. The input is the thing that, um, that you will be getting from somewhere that you will put into your function. I'm going to show examples of this in a moment, so it'll make a little bit more sense. Then, whatever you, um, you get for your input, you're going to do some operation to it. In this particular case, um, the operation is take that thing and add one to it. Um, and then you'll be given an output. Uh, in this case, the output is the function f. Um, this is, so it's very important that you're crystal clear on the notation. So if, if something is confusing, please type into the chat window. Um, this Interesting things to note here. The output of this, this notation, um, is a very special notation, which specifically means um, it's a single thing. I know it looks like it looks like the letter F multiplied by the letter X, which is not what this means. This is a special notation that means a separate thing. Um, what this means is this is a function. This whole output is a single is a single item. It will have a single re result. And the only reason um, we even put the X here at all. So you might be wondering, why don't we just write f? Um, why do we even have this parentheses x thing? The whole reason why we put the parentheses x thing there is to communicate to you what the input is. So when we go over to the operation, you need to know where to plug in the stuff that you get. And this is basically a key. It's telling you, look inside the operational portion of this function, and anywhere you see an x, that's where you're going to stuff anything you get as an input. Right? And the way that you know that it goes in the X is because that's written right here. The whole point of writing this here is to give you the nomenclature for that input. Okay, this is the, this is the key of all functions. So, I mean, this is basically it right here. If you understand this concept and you apply this correctly, you're done with functions. Everything else in functions is actually, you know, solving algebraic expressions or um, keeping track of numbers using a table and not making mistakes. This is the only part of it that really is specific to the, to the idea of functions. Because it's, very, it's a very straightforward thing. Um, Tanya, great question. Is the output just f, or is it f of x? That's really the same thing. So if you were to write a sentence and you, and you were to refer to, um, draw this, you were to say uh, the function f, That would be the same thing um, as the function f of x. 
the writing on this is a little slow. It'll be frustrating later. All right, so f, f of x, same exact thing. These are just different notations for referring to the same thing. One of them has the nomenclature of the x included, and the other one doesn't. But they mean exactly the same thing. So, um, more on functions. Here's another example. Um, let's start with um, f. This is pronounced f of x. That's how you pronounce this symbol. f of x equals x squared plus x. So what I want you guys to keep track of is the input, the operation, and the output for each of these. So in the chat window, um, what is the input in this particular case? Yes, the input here is x. What is the operation? The operation is x squared plus x. And then what is the output? Yeah, the output here is the function f. And I'll list this here with the, uh, with the x, just to be extra clear, although that's optional to write that. So let's try this with a number. Suppose we put, uh, and this is exactly how I would keep track of these if you're doing functions questions on the SAT. So if they ask you a question like this, if they said, what is the value of f um, when x is 2, what you would do is you'd put your 2, here is your input, and then you'll plug a 2 in everywhere that you have an x which is maybe a bad choice since the exponent is also 2. Um, plus x. Should be a plus sign. 2 squared is 4. I can't erase. Um, 2 squared is 4 plus we have another 2, which will make that equal to 6 in this case. So there's your output is 6. So if they said, what is the value of f when x is 2? The answer would be 6. Right? You can see here's our output f, and it equals 6 when the input x is equal to 2. All right. Now, quick little warning here. Functions are not equations. So what I'm su suggesting is that you keep track of the input, the operation, and the output when you're dealing with function questions. Make sure that you are, in fact, dealing with a function question. Don't try to apply these same techniques to an equation question, for example. All right, here in an equation question, um, it's asking you about, you know, here's an equation. It has things with equal signs, but notice none of these have a function. There's no f of x, there's no g of x in here. So this is just an, a straight up equation problem. All right, so let's take a look at some of the funny notations that you'll see in functions questions. Um, this, is, this is the test's main technique to confuse you, is they give you um, functions questions, but they disguise them by making them really weird and complicated. All right, for example, we've got writing, we've got tables. Um, here you've got your input, x. You've got your output, f of x. And where's the operation here? The operation is not specified in this particular function. All right, so sometimes you don't get everything. Um, here we've got graphs. Um, it's a little small. Can you see this? What is, the, what is the input for this particular function? Type in the chat window for this graph. Yeah, the x. And what is the output? The output is the vertical axis, yeah. It's also specified here. It says y equals f of x. So you could put y or f here because they're the same. 
And what is the operation? So how do we translate between the x and the f of x on this graph? Anybody down in the chat window? How do you do the operation here? So if, you, if somebody gives you an x, how do you translate that into words? Yes, it is the line. Very good, Michaela. It is this squiggly black line is the operation. Right? So this is a way of visually defining the operation of a function. So if you were given an x, you go over to that coordinate, you read up to its position on the, on the black line, and that is the output. And that's how you move from input to output using the graph. You may also be given an expression. This is one that we already looked at, um, so we don't think we need to go over that again. And you might be given a weird symbol. So here's another one that the test will do to you sometimes. It'll say, let, and it'll define some crazy picture um, like this, A, B, C, inside boxes, be defined as, and then it'll give you some expression. Um, it's helpful to, to realize in these situations when you see this crazy thing, Nobody else knows what that is either. This is not a thing that you're supposed to enter the test understanding. This is something that they're making up on the spot. Right, and they might as well, this is exactly like saying, anytime you see one of these crazy symbols, you can always remember this is exactly the same as saying, um, let me write this out, it's like saying f of um, a, b, and C. These are supposed to be separated with commas. Right? That's the same thing as this, as this gobbledygook down here. The only reason that they give you this, the function in this picture, instead of just saying f of ABC, is just to confuse you. It's to see if you can fight through that and you can work with different uh, visual notations for functions. That's it. There's literally nothing else to that. All right, so let's go through a couple of examples. Um, we're going to start out. Um, easier and we're going to end up harder. So buckle your seatbelt, it gets a little challenging toward the end here. Uh, when you figure out the answer, don't send it in the chat window. Answer in the multiple choice poll, which is above the chat window. I'm going to clear the results right now so you can click your letter answer when you get it. All right, so let's use, even though this is a, uh, a simpler problem, let's keep track of the, in, guys, put your, uh, put your answers in the multiple choice poll instead of in the chat window um, so that we can avoid spoilers for anybody who's still working. Don't worry about it if you already did it, but just for the next one. So let's use good notation here, so which will set us up um, for making these easier to track next time. So, um, for positive integers a, b, and c, let this funky thing be defined by, um, and they give you an expression. So let's keep track of our input, our operation, and our output. So here's the input. Um, we'll keep track of our operation, and we'll keep track of our output. So what is, in this particular case, the input is what? What do you have to send into this thing? Type this into the chat window. A, B, and C, exactly. And what is the operation? Type that in the chat window. Yeah, the operation is that expression, right? It's A to the B minus AC 
plus C. And the output is A, B, C in that box. Okay. So they give us 5, 2, and 6. So let's try putting 5, 2, and 6 into our operation. So we'll get 5 square 5 to the to the b which is 2 minus 5 times 2 plus c which in this case is 6 right and so what you'll get is 25 minus 10 plus 6 Oh, that's, oh, that's A to the C. This should be 5 times 6. can't quite read that anyway. So whoever, I'm not sure who I, who I got that from in the chat window, but make sure you've got A to the B minus A times C. So that'll give you 25 minus 30 plus 6. Which is equal to 1. All right. So all right, here's another one. If you had trouble with that one, make sure you keep track of your input, your operation, and your output. All right, when you've got your answer, um, pull that into the multiple choice poll above the chat window. Okay, so what is the, um, and we already covered this before, but let's just go over it again really quickly. What is the input here? Yeah, the input here is the x-axis. Okay, and what is the operation? 
The operation is what's tricky here. Somebody nailed it um, earlier. Yeah, here the operation is actually the black line. It is, it is this thing. I'll draw it. I'm just going to draw it over here so I don't pollute the part of the drawing that I need. It is that black line right there. And so what is the output here? Key concept. The input is the x. The operation is you go find that x on the black line. And the output is whatever you get on the y-axis. Okay, so the figure, now let's read the instructions and, and follow along. Yeah, we'll keep track of our inputs and outputs. The figure above shows the graph of y equals f of x from negative 8 to 8. Here's your negative 8, and here's your 8. And it says, for what value of x in this interval does the function f attain its maximum value? So first of all, where is the point where the function f attains its maximum value? So we measure, so again, we're looking for a spot on the black line where the function, which is measured on in vertical distance, is at its maximum. So the point where this, basically, where the black line is highest is right here. But that's not what they've asked for. So what they've asked for is, for what value of x does the function attain its maximum value? So the output, what is the maximum value, is actually 5. It's right here. You can count the hash marks, but that's a 5. Is what they start out with. They're saying, figure out where it's at its max, which, it, which we did, and it's 5. Then you're actually going to do the, the black line in reverse and figure out what the x was when it was 5. And what is the x if you read it off there? It's a 4. Right, so I'm basically taking this, this dot and I'm drawing it straight down. And the test will expect you to do this, which is eyeball this. It's considered fair game when you interpret this chart. Let's draw that down and eyeball it to be a 4. So the, again, the operation is the black line. We're using it in reverse. All right, any questions here about the input and the output? Um, just how do you know for sure that each space increases by 1? Um, you know it because they give you the 8s. Right, they give you the eights and they give you the hash marks. And Josh, you're asking, can we assume this? The things you can assume are that the hash marks are evenly spaced. Um, I, I, I'm, yes, I agree with you that it's not. It is not. It is not watertight that that is true. But the test will, will expect you to make that assumption that the, that the lines are evenly spaced. How do you make the function equation per se from a graph? You, so you can't. Um, in this particular graph, you know they just chose to draw this squiggly line here, um, and there's no way to make a uh, like a function. You're talking about an algebraic expression. So the output's not the black line. The operation is the black line. 
And the operation is what you use to get between the input and the output. So in this particular case, the input is the x coordinate, right? So at any point on this on this x on this x axis, you can pick a point, right? So anywhere from negative eight all the way up to eight, right? Then what you do? So let's say that we we pick a four. Let's go the other direction. Let's say that we pick the the, uh, the spot four, which is this dot right here. That's our input. We picked it on the x-axis. Then what you do is you follow that up vertically until you hit the black line. Following it up vertically to hit the black line, that is the operation. This is how you read a function in graphical form. Is you, you pick an x and you move vertically until you hit the black line. That's the operation. Once you hit the black line, you move over to the side to figure out where you are on the vertical axis. And I've drawn all over this, so it's harder to see now. But this does hit the vertical axis at 5. And that's how you read out the output. So the output here is whatever's on the vertical axis, which in this case is 5. So this is good. All the questions that are coming in, they're not, they're not really about algebra. They're not about expressions. The questions are about how do we know what the input and the output are. And that's exactly what you should be doing when you're dealing with functions questions, right? You should be trying to keep track of the input, the operation, and the output. And that's what the test is going to do to try to confuse you. All right, let's move on to another one. Um, here's where they start to get really tough. This question is um, the top level of difficulty. So I'll give you a couple minutes to do this one. Um, when you're finished, select your multiple choice answer in the multiple choice poll above the chat. Okay, go ahead and um, pull in the multiple, your multiple choice answer and the multiple choice poll. Um, if you're not sure, that's okay. I've got responses from uh, about half of the field right now. And let's take a look at, um, this is a very difficult question, so it's okay if you don't know. Um, the important thing that I want you to take away from here is how to keep track of input, operation, and output. So. Um, First, let's start documenting some of these. Let's see, input, um, we're gonna keep track of the operation, and we wanna we want to know the output. 
So we've actually been given the input, the operation, and the output um, already um, by the question. So what is the input here? Type that in the chat window. Where would you find it? Yes, it is X. And you can find that, um, again, right here, special notation, function notation. This is the thing inside the parentheses is how you know um, what the input will be. In this particular case, they've given you a table that has values for X, uh, which is given in the top row here. It's the input is that X. Um, the operation is, is given down in the question, and it's K, um, A, uh, K A to the X. And then the output is what? Yeah, the output is F of X. I should say F of X. Okay. Why is it so important to keep driving these? Great, great question, Josh. Um, this particular question, in, you'll see. Um, so in the, in the other two questions that we did, I think it would be possible to do it without writing down a table. This particular one, I think you'll see that it, it becomes really important to keep track because you're going to have to do so many of these um, in order to figure it out. So it says, for some constants k and a, what is the value of a? So this is already getting a little bit complicated. Um, and I think we actually need to keep track of a couple other things. So you'll notice that in your operation, the operation deals with uh, three letters, not X, not just X. It deals with K, A, and X. And they're trying to ask you, what is the value of A? So even though they haven't defined it as a variable, it's probably something we also need to keep track of. So I'm going to say, let's keep track of K and A also. And those are basically inputs. So we have an X, the inputs are X, K, and A. The operation is K times A to the X. And the output is the result of that, which we're calling F of X. And so they're asking, um, based on this table, which shows inputs and outputs, what is the value of A? So here what's unique is that you're given values for the in and you're given values for the out. And what you're asked to figure out is actually what's the operation. The unknown here is actually the operation, um, which is so what's so difficult to come up with. So rather than what I would advocate is rather than trying to solve this um, using algebra, why don't you just pick a number and plug in and, and see what happens, right? So let's try, let's just try one. So let's try answer choice C, which is a value of two. And remember, the answer choice is giving us the value of A. What is the value of A? So I'm going to keep track of that in this chart here by listing it under A. So let's say A is 2. And let's go up to our, to our chart and say that we're dealing with the first column, which is a negative 1 for X. So let's plug in a negative 1 here for X. And what's the output is 1 eighth. Right, which we'd also read off of that chart. Okay, let's plug that into our equation here. And k we still don't know, so we end up with k um, times our hypothetical a of 2 to the negative 1. x is negative 1, remember. And I think, I think it was Josh who pointed this out earlier, is that one thing that we know, we can always set up this, um, we can always set up an equation is set the, oper set the operation equal to the output. So we know that um, k times 2 to the negative 1 should be equal to 1 eighth. And you can solve this then. And what you end up with is um, k um, equals... What is that, one quarter? Right, so in order to make that 
equation that we have up here work out, k must be equal to one quarter. Um, Michaela's saying, if you use the answer choices to solve, should you always start with C? Well, so Michaela, I would start with C if they're in order. So you notice how they're going from 1 half to 16 and they're ascending? So I'm starting with the middle one because what I'm hoping is that, um, I'm assuming that C will not be the right answer, right? It's a one in five shot that I'm going to happen to pick the right answer. So when I get it wrong, hopefully it'll provide some information to me about which direction to go and how far to go. So if I think like, oh, it needs to be higher, but just a little bit higher, then I can choose D. If it needs to be a lot higher, then I need to choose E. So I can zero in on it a little bit better. So you can pick up a little speed. So we solved this and we got K equals one quarter. Well, what does that mean for us? How do, how do you interpret that, that result? Well, so far it actually doesn't, it doesn't really tell us anything. We picked a hypothetical A, we solved for K and we got one quarter. Um, but there's no, I don't know how to, I don't know how to interpret that. Does one quarter mean correct or incorrect or, or whatever, right? What you don't want to do is go over and pick one quarter. One quarter is not the answer, so don't pick B. One quarter is the value of K. They have not asked us for the value of K. But what they have told us is that K is a constant. And what that means is that if we try a different column in this chart, so let's try, we have to do this again. This is part of what makes this so hard. We've got to do this whole thing again using a different column. And we're going to take the same K, so we're going to take the same X and take the same A, and we're going to plug it in. We're going to get the new output, one half, and we're going to solve for K again. And if, if we picked the right A, then k will come out to be one quarter. So let's try plugging in again. So in this particular case, x is zero. Um, k is unknown. So I'll put a question mark here for k. And a is two again. Remember, I'm sticking with the same a. So we're still evaluating answer choice c. So let's go do our operation, which is we'll get k times a, which is 2, this time to the 0, equals, what does it equal in this case? It's the output in that second column, 1 half. Yes, Josh, right now I'm checking to see that k is constant, because they told us k was constant. So if, if I solve this, and it turns out I get a different k, if k is not 1 quarter, then I know that I picked the wrong a because k was not, in fact, constant. So, in fact, so I'm going to solve this, and I and actually see, so k times 2 to the 0, 2 to the 0 is 1. So that means k is equal to 1 half. And we're going to compare these two k's. And you can see that, that they're not equal. But we were told that k needed to be constant. k was a constant. I underlined that in the problem. So what that means is that c is not the answer. So I'm going to eliminate that permanently. Now I'm going to kind of just check my gut a little bit to try to figure out which one to pick next. And um, you can see in here that um, what we really want is for k to be a small fraction. So we go from 2 to the negative 1 to 2 to the 0. We go from 1 eighth um, to 1 half. So this is a factor of 4, right, going from 1 eighth to 1 half. That's a factor of 4 jump. So I'm going to try... Um, let's try answer choice D. For our A. Right, so when we go from negative 1 to 0, we'll get a factor of 4 jump. I'm going to delete some of this so we have more room to write. All right, so let's try this again. 
Now our x, let's, let's, what are our inputs? So our, we're picking, um, and let's start over. So we're going to go negative 1 for x. Again, k is our question mark. And a this time is 4. So what we're going to have is k. And I'm going to do the same solving now. k, a, to the negative 1. And the output should be 1 eighth. And let's solve for, um, oh, I, I wrote A there. I should have written 4. So this, is, uh, this A is actually a 4. Right, so this is k times 4 to the negative 1 equals 1 eighth. So that's, um, so then this k is equal to what? 1 half? Okay, so let's pick a different column and we'll try it again. And we're hoping that we're going to get k equals 1 half again because k needs to be constant. So let's try the second column. So it has an x of 0 a k that's unknown, and a of 4. Let's try our operation, which is k times the a, which is 4, just like before. It's multiplied, it's a bit raised to the 0 power this time, and the output is 1 half. So we get k equals one half. Pull on down to k level. We'll come right back to that. Okay, so we ended up with k equals one half. Compare the k's. They're equal. What that means is we have solved it. So A is 4, which means you can pick answer choice D here. Oof, okay, so that is a really difficult problem. So how do we, how do we make, um, make this manageable? You keep track of your input, your operation, and your output. Um, Michaela, great advice um, down there in the chat window. Um, she has a shortcut in here proposed. You could solve for k using the second column um, no matter what. And why does that work? Well, notice that um, a is always raised to the 0 power in the second column. right? So if x is 0, a will always be raised to the 0, which means you can, you can solve for k must equal 1 half. Right? So we just found that k equals 1 half by trial and error. But you could have, if you were clever, this is not the kind of thing you'd be able to repeat on any, on any other functions question. This is specific to this problem only. It just so happens we have a 0 as the input, and something is raised to the power of 0, which always equals 1 in the operation. So if you're very clever, you could spot a shortcut like that, like Michaela did, and it'll allow you to make this problem a little bit faster. Right? Cleverness aside, um, the thing that you need to be able to do here, the skill that you need in order to get this question right, is be able to track the input, the operation, the output without getting confused. So write it down on paper, keep track of a table, be systematic in your approach, and, and you will be able to figure it out. Um, Alexander, that's, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, you know, what he's saying is, um, the SAT is testing your ability to find the shortcut, not testing your ability to do trial and error. You're right. They're, I mean, they're testing you on not only being able to get the question right, but being able to get it correctly quickly. Sorry, being able to get the question correct quickly. You need to be able to do both things. Um, so you really do need both skills um, at the end of the day, right? You need to be able to keep track of your input, your operation, your output. That's a, that's a valuable skill. That's what we're learning right now. Uh, that's the pur purpose of this presentation. 
um, you know, if you want to move your score up, you also need to be finding shortcuts. You don't have to find that, of course. You could still solve it without it. Uh, but shortcuts do turn into points. So you can work on both of those skills. Um, and just here, so do I use plugin when there are variables? Um, uh, Andrew, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. In this particular one, you need to. In this particular one, you need to try. You need to try plugging in, um, because they. Uh, and this is what's interesting about this particular function is they give you the input and the output, but not the operation. So you need to plug something in somewhere, uh, in order to solve back to get some of those constants. There's really, there's really no way to do it without plugging in. In this particular question, right? And and again. Part of how you can of how you know that is because if you keep track of the input, the operation, the output, what you'll figure out here is that oh, the operation is the part that I need to solve for. That's the part where I'm not given anything. So you know you can plug in the ins and the outs and then work your way back to that operation. And on a function question, you could you know you'll always be given two, but not the third thing. And you'll always be trying to figure out that third thing. They might give you the operation, the output, and you have to figure out the input. They might give you the input and the operation, you have to figure out the output. Uh, or in this case, they give you the in and the out, but not the operation. So there's there's always something for you to go and figure out. Okay, so um, I do have another question, but uh, we're we're over time. This one's already been quite long, so I want to uh, to wrap this up for you guys. Um, Thank you so much for coming. If you want to do further practice, specifically on functions questions, you can do that at testive.com. Uh, there's free questions there and answer explanations to go along with them and guides to, to explain all this stuff. Um, and or you can work with a one-on-one, -on -one 99 percentile scoring coach. Uh, there was a question in the chat window earlier about uh, where can I go to get advice on reading and writing. We also do that at Testive. It's also free. If you go to www.testive.com, um, you can have access to all of our written, writing, and reading, and math um, guidance. You can also do practice problems, practice tests. Um, you can watch video answer explanations. All of that stuff is free. If you want to get unlimited access, you can also get, you can pay more to get that. You can also sign up to work with a coach. You need to acknowledge a bunch of people that help us put this together. Miro, Miro, Kaz, Kazakoff, Jackson, Harvard, Noel, David, Pikachu, Chippendale, Lee, The Chemist, Akamando, Shonak, The Closer, Patel. Morella, Brazil, Crespi, David, Chubby Shorts, Tyson, Charles, Kitten, Smuggler, Reese, Abby, the St. Engelstead, Will, the Institute, Eden, and Meg Smiles, Butler. Thank you, everybody, for helping put that together. Thank you for coming today. This is Study Hall. Um, you can get back to studyhall.tested.com. Monday is 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, on your way out, um, please, uh, please give us feedback if you think of it. Before you take off, love to hear uh, to hear what you liked and what you would change if you could do this again. I'm going to put all of these out here. Also, I'm putting up a, uh, a section for requests. If you hang out for a minute, I'm going to put up another question, even harder than the last one. So if you found that one to be easy. I've got another one that'll be even more challenging for you. Let me know in the chat window if you can't see these polls. There's a bit of a difference between um, what I see in the moderator view and what you guys see. We're also doing um, free 30-minute sessions uh, with an expert coach. You can sign up for that at scheduler.tested.com. Thank you guys for coming. I um, hope you guys are totally kicking butt on those functions questions now.